Welcome to this special edition of the Remnant Report. I am your host, the Remnant Warrior, a.k.a. Pastor Jeremy Anderson. I said that backwards, so you're just going to have to forgive me. I have got a special guest co-host with me tonight, Austin Blaze. We are seeing war in Israel where before, just four years ago, when Donald Trump was in office, they had the Abraham Accords, right? And not only that, but we are on the precipice of the elections here in America. And let's face it, the chances of Donald Trump losing that election are slim to none so long as he isn't assassinated. But I tell you what, I know that like in... One of the songs that is on my album called Welcome to the Matrix, you know, it it talks about only God can give life. And that is the truth. You know, when Revelation 13 tells us about the beast having the deadly head wound and then being healed, you know, he's not he's it says he's wounded unto death, but did live. But we know that Satan doesn't have the power to give life. So either God brought the Antichrist back to life, which I find a hard time believing if it isn't in the scripture and it's not. Or it just seemed like he was killed. Now, I've heard other people talk about the little nick in the ear being the deadly head wound, and that's laughable. But it does make you think like. The next one could be a lot closer. It doesn't have to be Donald Trump. It really doesn't. It doesn't have to be President Trump. I don't want to disrespect the man. I mean, I I honestly have no respect for him, for his office, or for politics in general. But that is only because, I mean, that I serve a king. You know, I am an ambassador, not only to the kingdom that I am a citizen of, but to its king, my king. My king literally gave his life for me. He didn't have the appearance of a deadly wound. Our king literally was tortured to death from being whipped all the way to the cross when he was stabbed in the side. He was literally tortured for our sins i mean when you read i always i can remember growing up and hearing the literal account of the crucifixion from isaiah and thinking it was something in the new testament i mean it wasn't until i was a grown man uh, i wasn't following christ and i wasn't I definitely wasn't in the ministry, but I was a grown man before I realized that that was in Isaiah. Um, I used to read my Bible constantly. Um, You know, when I was in jail, I would, that's just one of the things I did. Um, uh, I made false promises and read the Bible. But one thing that's awesome that came from that is the knowledge of the scriptures that I would not have otherwise. Um, 
I would have never known anything about the Prince of Persia or the Prince of Greece. And, you know, I honestly, Austin and I were talking before we started, and there obviously is a principality behind modern-day Israel, Canaan land, um, Phoenicia, whatever you want to call it. Uh, people fuss about it being called Palestine. That just comes from Philistia, you know, the, where the Philistines came from. <laughs> I, I just don't understand why people can't trace etymology and quit getting so angry over words. But I, I am seeing something that Gary Wayne pointed out, and I used to argue that this was false. One thing that Steve Gregg argues heavy in this as he tells how the Rothschilds and the Zionists bring the modern nation state of Israel into being and into a superpower. He says, you know, something that I believe for many years that because it was done by man and it was done by wicked Luciferians, that it could not be a fulfillment of prophecy. How much of the book of Revelation prophecy now is done by wicked, not just men, fallen angels, the actual Antichrist, the false prophet. I mean, regardless what your interpretation of what the beast out of the sea or the beast out of the earth is or, you know, whatever, there's you can argue if Revelation 13 is even talking about you know, beings, but you really can't argue that when you get to Revelation 9. Bro, Abaddon comes out of the pit, and he is a fallen angel. Yeah. He's the destroyer. And so just because something is wicked, just because something is not godly, definitely does not mean it's not fulfilling. I want to add, because I will 100% forget, Copernicus. He was a member of the Knights Templar. Absolutely. Big stacked into things. And then we said about the Big Bang and the creator of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, what's his name? What's his name? Um, he was a, a, a Jesuit I, priest. Um, yeah, Curtis Lemaitre, a uh -huh. Jesuit priest, which again gets mixed into all this same stuff and goes back to the oh, yeah. same old. Yeah, it, it is his son worship. As I said, in 1917, Arthur James Balfour issued the Balfour Declaration, which announced Britain's interest in reestablishing a homeland for the Jews in Palestine in their ancient home. And then in 1922, the United, not the United Nations, but the League of Nations, uh, they, they had a mandate where they put Palestine which was, uh, it'd be wrong to call it Israel at this point because there was no nation of Israel there yet. But they put Palestine under the control of the British and Syria under the control of the French. Now, the British, soon after that, well, not real soon, about 20 years later, about 1947, the British announced that they were not interested in continuing to govern Palestine. Now, one reason for that is because Jewish terrorists were blowing up their soldiers and policemen and hanging them and doing things like that. Uh, yes, the Jewish terrorists were. Menachem Begin, who you might recognize if you paid attention to Jewish political history in recent years, or at least in recent decades in my lifetime, very important, uh, one of the presidents of Israel, I think he was the sixth, I'm not positive about the number there, uh, he was the head of an organization called Irgun, which was a Jewish terrorist organization. Among other things, they blew up the King David Hotel a few years before Israel was made a nation, killing like 90 people, this is where the British troops were housed, killed a bunch of British soldiers by blowing up a hotel. So the kind of stuff you think that only Arabs do. This was a Jewish terrorist organization headed by Menachem Begin. He is not, this is not a secret. He's publicly, I mean, this is, he couldn't deny it anyway, but he public, publicly acknowledges it. And, uh, and they were not the only Jewish terrorist organization. And they were making it really hard for the British to govern there, just like the Romans had found it hard to govern that land. In fact, everyone, Babylon, everyone, you know, everyone had found it hard to govern that land. But um, the British didn't like it, and they announced in 1947 their intention to give up their authority over it. 
And so something else had to happen. No one else wanted to govern it. And that's why the idea of a Jewish state tended to uh, come to, to the fore more. But what the League of Nations decided was to divide Palestine into two nations, a Jewish nation and a Palestinian Arab nation. And they were going to give 52% of the land to the Jewish nation. Now, remember, for 1,300 years, Palestinians thought that was where they lived. That was their country. Imagine if the United Nations today would just make a mandate that said they're going to give uh, you know, the Navajo Indians 52% of the places where we live now. Now, I don't have anything against the Navajo Indians. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the house that my parents live in, you know, the house that my grandparents live in, uh, suddenly they got you know, to move out because this now belongs to the Navajos. Uh, and where do we go? Well, that's your problem. You see, the land was populated by the Palestinians, and very, fairly densely so, for 1,300 years. Now, 52% of the property that's theirs is going to be given to another nation uh, called Israel. And then 48% of the land was going to go to um, the Arab population there. This plan was approved by a two to three majority vote in the, United, uh, the uh, League of Nations General Council. Actually, by this time, I'm sorry, it was now the United Nations. The League of Nations was between the two world wars. By 1947, there had been World War II, and instead of the League of Nations, there was the United Nations. So it was the UN Nations mandate. Uh, they, they wanted to have a two-nation solution. But what that meant was that they're going to take over 50% of the land that always had belonged to the Palestinians, at least for over a millennium, and give it to somebody else who didn't even live there for the most part. And you might say, well, weren't there Jews living there? A few. 95% of the population of the region were Arabs. 5% were Jewish. And they're going to give 52% of the land to the Jews. Okay. And, and what that means is that the Arabs who had been living on that land, it was now no longer theirs. Now, no one can approve, I hope, of any of the terrorist acts done by either Israelis or Arabs. And the ones we hear about the most in our news are the ones now done by Hamas and, and by Arab groups. Partly because Israel's an ally of the United States and, and the press tends to uh, publicize what things are done against our allies. And uh, there is terrorism on both sides. I do, I am under the impression, though I've heard people say that I'm naive about this, that perhaps there's more terrorism now being done by the Arabs than by the Jews. I can't guarantee that. And I do have a friend who tells me I'm quite wrong about that. And it does, it does depend on which media you read. But the point is, while we, we could never approve of terrorism done by anybody, you might understand if, you know, some European entity decided that the United States, the portion you live in, is no longer going to belong to you. You might have bought it. You might have inherited it from your great-grandparents. But it's not yours anymore. It now belongs to some other ethnic group that they are saying, this is going to be theirs now. Now, you, you might not like that very much. You know, I, I was watching a movie some years ago. I don't, I don't remember which movie it was. I was going to say it was Sophie's Choice, but I don't think it was. I, I don't remember. Did Sophie's Choice have a section where they were in the, the Polish ghetto, where the, Jew, the Nazis had rounded up the Jews, and they were in the Polish ghettos there? Was that? Okay, maybe it was that. And I remember watching it, thinking... Those poor Jews, the Nazis have rounded them up and put them in a, a corner. And, and the, there were Jewish guys who'd sneak out at night and do terrorist acts against the Nazis. And the audience, being Western people like ourselves, of course, were on their side. Yay, take out those Nazis. The enemy of my enemy is my enemy. I mean, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Let's put it that way. Uh, and therefore, but then I got thinking, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm in favor of these Jews defending themselves against this. They're freedom fighters. I remember thinking for the first time in my life, what if these were Palestinian Arabs who had been rounded up off their property by, let's say, a Jewish majority, and they were running out and doing those same kind of things to Jews? We'd call that terrorism, not freedom fighting. But they would see it as freedom fighting. So, I mean, not, not to say that terrorism is ever okay. I'm totally against all terrorism. But you can say, if you're in their position, you can see maybe why they're getting frustrated, because they're... What they thought was theirs was taken from them just by a mandate from someone who doesn't live anywhere nearby. These people are in the Middle East, they've been there for 1,300 years, and someone over in Europe, another continent, is making decisions about who owns their land. I'm not sure you'd like that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do terroristic acts because I'm a Christian. Christians don't do that kind of thing. But I wouldn't like it. And I think I would understand those who do do acts of violence to try to restore their land. They wouldn't be Christian acts, but they'd be kind of understandable in some ways. Well, in April 9th, 1948, this is just before Israel was declared to be a nation, 
Irgun, a Jewish paramilitary group led by Menachem Begin, killed, by some reports, 254 Arab men, women, and children in a village called Dir Yassin. This is a Yassin, excuse me, Dir Yassin. This is a well-known fact. There's many books, articles about it. It's, it's well documented. It was witnessed. The survivors have told their stories. It's not denied. Even the Jews don't deny that this happened. This is before this was the nation of Israel. Menachem Begin and his terrorist group went into Dir Yassin and killed 250-something men, women, and children. To read the reports, it was just as ugly as Nazis coming in and killing innocent Jews. These were not militants that were being killed. These were peasants, farmers. It's just a village that Israel wanted. And they did this, by the way, with quite a few villages. But this event was very noteworthy because it led to an era of retaliation. Three days later, on April 12, 1948, by way of reprisal, Arabs killed 77 Jewish doctors, nurses, teachers, and university students in a convoy traveling from Hadassah, from, from, to the Hadassah Hospital, excuse me. So some medical staff and students were traveling in a convoy to a hospital, and Arabs killed 77 of them. This was in reprisal for having wiped out 254 men, women, and children at an Arab village. So both sides had blood on their hands. And that, things didn't get better after that. It was sort of like the Hatfields and the McCoys, you know? They just, you know, there's always another person to, you know, pay back for something, the last thing the other one did, and it just goes on like a family feud. And, and that's why the Middle East is, is all uh, messed up as it is. But what happened was, in 1948, Israel declared independence from Britain, from uh, the other Palestinians. They just declared independence. Now, remember, the UN had partitioned into two states where the Jews were supposed to get 52% and the Arabs 48%. The Arabs never liked that. They never agreed to it. They, no one asked them. They just said, no, that, we don't agree to that. Well, then this war broke out in 1948 when the Israelis, Israelis declared independence and the, and the United Nations uh, recognized them. And then the Israelis had a, an all-out war that went on for some time. Uh, it was uh, The British mandate ended in May 14th, 1948. The same day, Dr. Kaim Weitzman, who was the first... Uh, president, I think, or prime minister of Israel, raised a flag on the star of, with the Star of David, and David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the new state of Israel. The Arabs did not agree with the UN partition plan, and they sought to destroy the Jewish state. Within hours of the proclamation, forces from Jordan, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, and Iraq attacked. Arab troops were disorganized, had no central leadership, and they were no match for Israelis, uh, the Israelis and their modern Western supplied war uh, fighting force and so forth. Uh, fighting continued for seven months. By the time of the ceasefire in January 1949, Israel controlled 77% of the land instead of the 52% that was given by the partition plan. They now had 77% of the land, including Galilee and the Negev, which would have been part of the Arab state under the partition. Jerusalem was divided with Israel controlling the western and Jordan controlling the eastern sectors. Jordan also annexed the West Bank. Now, Palestinian Arab society was largely destroyed. In the war, that seven-month war, 750,000 Palestinians fled from their homes because the Israelis with superior fighting force came into their villages and were killing people and, and, and destroying them. So uh, three-quarters of a million Palestinians fled just into the wilderness. It'd be as if, let's just say, North Korea, or let's say China, because they have a larger fighting force, invaded America, and they were coming into our cities, and we all fled into the woods or out into the desert to just kind of scratch out some subsistence survival because our homes had been invaded by invaders coming in. Well, that's what happened to 750,000 Palestinians. They became refugees. Other nations didn't want to take them in, and they weren't allowed to come back to their homes after the fighting was over. And they just became refugees. And um, so their society was largely destroyed. 750,000 Palestinians fled their homes, their farms. They crossed, they crossed borders into Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. About 200,000 were confined to the Gaza Strip, uh, which is uh, only 139 square miles in, in size, which already had 88,000 residents. These Palestinians were not permitted by Israel to return home after the ceasefire. They became homeless refugees. Over the next three years, the new wave of immigrants, meaning Jewish immigrants from Europe and other places, doubled the Jewish population of Israel. And so from that time on, of course, Jews from all over the world have immigrated to Israel so that they've, the Israelis are, of course, the dominant 
uh, ethnic group there now. And Palestinians are still marginalized into places like Gaza and, you know, West Bank and places like that. But Israel has fought some more wars. The Six Day War, for example, they recovered uh, many of the territories that, that uh, Jordan had controlled, including all of Jerusalem. And that war, by the way, was sparked by Egypt lining up munitions in the Sinai, which does not belong to Palestine, it belongs to Egypt, but they, they brought troops and stuff into the Sinai and seemed to be menacing <clears throat> the state of Israel. This is 1967. They didn't attack, and there's no guarantee that they would attack, but they might have planned to. But the Israelis, their air force took off and destroyed like 85% of the Egyptian air force while they were on the ground. And that's why the Six Day War was only six days. It didn't last very long at all, because within hours, basically the Egyptian air force was destroyed uh, by a preemptive strike by Israel. Now, it's possible that that preemptive strike saved Israel from a, a strike that would have come from the Egyptians. No one knows. The Egyptians didn't strike, and so we don't know if they were going to or if they're just building up the border there. In any case, Christians have to say, well, why did all this happen? Did God make this happen? Well, maybe he did. God does raise up kingdoms and brings down kingdoms. I can't say that Israel doesn't exist in the land today because of God. Maybe God is the one who did it. But I can say that its claim on the land is no different than the claim on the land of any nation in the land they live in. There is no biblical mandate. In the, there's nothing in the Bible that says that they own that by some kind of divine mandate. There's no prophecy that's fulfilled by them being there. That's what I would argue. I'd, I'd certainly invite anybody who thinks otherwise to present one for me. Um, but it is because of uh, Zionism, which uh, was, of course, a movement to get the Jews back to Palestine and have their own Jewish state. The Balfour Declaration was not the first time anyone had an idea about it. That's just the first time that a, a, a nation expressed an interest in making it happen. The dispensationalists were promoting that before that. I mentioned uh, William Blackstone. William Blackstone was a premillennial dispensational Christian. And I'm reading this from uh, Jerry Klinger, president of the Jewish American Society for Historic Preservation. Okay, this is a Jewish historian writing this. He said, Reverend William E. Blackstone was a di premillennial dispensational Christian evangelist and missionary. He was the author of a hugely successful and influential book called Jesus is Coming in 1878. That's before Herzl started Zionism. His book, The Veritable Reference Source of American Dispensationalist Thought, sold millions of copies. It was translated into 48 languages. It's sort of like the late great planet Earth of the late 19th century. It's what Hal Lindsey's book did in, in the 1970s. Uh, it translated into 48 languages, Blackstone clearly laid out a, the biblical justification for the return of the Jews to the reestablishment of the Jewish state as a precondition for the second coming of Jesus. Now, this is a Jewish writer telling us about Blackstone, not a Christian writer. His efforts influenced countless millions of Christians to identify as Christian Zionists. Now, Jerry Klinger, the same writer, says this. In 1891, Blackstone assembled a memorial to President Harrison. The memorial was signed by 413 prominent Americans, business leaders such as J.P. Morgan, John Rockefeller, prominent congressional leaders, including William McKinley, the later American president, Thomas Reed, Speaker of the House of Representatives, religious leaders, Christian and Jewish, editors and publishers and major American print media. These are all the guys who signed this thing. And even the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Melville Fuller. The memorial, this is a written thing that was signed by all these people, called for the American support in concert with the world community for the creation of a humanitarian solution to the Jewish suffering in Russia. This is before World War II, when there was the Holocaust. His solution, permit the Jews to return to Palestine. The memorial was formally presented to President Harrison, March 5th, 1891. That's before Herzl started secular Zionism. The memorial was a major American news for a week, or for weeks. The complete text was printed in the Chicago Tribune. President Harrison did not move on the proposal. But 25 years later, in 1916, a similar memorial was presented to President Woodrow Wilson. This document had an influence upon Wilson, encouraging his sympathy with the Balfour Declaration, Britain's first official endorsement of Zionism. Nathan, Str now I want you to know that the leader of American Zionism, there was Zionism in other countries too, but American Zionism had as its leader, the first Jewish Supreme Court justice who was appointed by Woodrow Wilson whose name was Louis Brandeis, very famous Jewish thinker. There's a Brandeis University, I believe, named after him. He was a, a Jewish 
Supreme Court justice, the very first Jew to be appointed to such an office. He became the leader of American Zionism. Now, here's an interesting thing. Nathan Strauss, assistant to Louis Brandeis, that is, assistant to the Jewish Supreme Court justice, who is the leader of American Zionism in the early part of, the, of this uh, last century. Nathan Strauss was assistant to Louis Brandeis. He wrote to Reverend Blackstone, May 8th, 1916. And here's what this leading Jewish Zionist, secular Zionist, wrote to this dispensational preacher. He says, Mr. Brandeis is perfectly infatuated with the work that you have done along the lines of Zionism. It would have done your heart good to have heard him assert what a valuable contribution to the cause your document is. In fact, he agrees with me that you are the father of Zionism as your work predates Herzl. So the leading authority who headed up American Zionism, Louis Brandeis, Supreme Court Justice, believed that real Zionism's father, the real father was a dispensational preacher who pushed president after president to support the creation of the state of Israel. Now, Israel was eventually recognized by the United Nations, but it was only through the United States' influence. And that was later on under, under Harry Truman. Uh, I won't go into all that now, but uh, suffice to say that there's nothing about this that would not be capable of being seen as a self-fulfilling prophecy. The dispensationalists were the first in modern history to suggest that Israel would ever become a nation again. And then they pushed for it and pushed for it and pushed for it for, for generations. Finally, especially after World War II, when it was clear from both world wars that the Jews were, were badly persecuted in the lands where they were exiles, general support for the establishment of a Jewish nation became an international issue. And therefore, Harry Truman actually strongly pressured many reluctant United Nations members to support it. Um, he actually called some of the world leaders in some of the South American countries and said they'll get no more financial support or no more support of certain types from America if they don't vote for the establishment of the Jewish nation. This was all political. And it was a po political that was strongly influenced by dispensational sentiments. Now, we could say, but God did it through these means. I'd say, okay. I, don't, I'm not, I won't say God can't have done it through those means. What I'm saying is it could have happened through these means whether God did it or not. This is, this is a very political thing. Now, like I said at the beginning, I'm not against Israel being a nation. I'm not against America being a nation. And we weren't here first. And also, not only were we not here first, but we, had some, we did some rather nasty things to the, the Native Americans. But that doesn't mean our nation is illegitimate. It means that every pagan nation, which ours is, yes, of course, the founders of our nation, some of them were Christians and some of them were deists and uh, most of them were God-fearing people. But nonetheless, it's a secular nation. It's, it, our constitution does not mention God. Our Declaration of Independence mentions a creator, but doesn't mention Jesus Christ. Unlike the charters of most of the, the European nations, most of them mention Jesus Christ as the Lord in their charters because those nations, modern nations, were founded during the time under Catholicism or Protestantism where they had you know, national religions. America was deliberately founded by people who didn't want there to be a state religion. And so there's no mention of Jesus Christ in our founding documents. And we are and were founded to be one of the first pluralist, religiously pluralistic nations. Now, the fact that many of the people who were founders were Christians and that Christianity is the most vigorous and believable of all religions in the world, you know, obviously meant that America has always had a strong Christian influence and rightly so, thankfully for all of us. But that doesn't mean that we always did Christian things. Things we did to the Native Americans, some of them are despicable. Uh, but I still believe that we have every right to be here because pagan nations usually become what they are and have the territory they do by conquering someone else and usually not in very pretty ways. That's what Israel has done too. And it's, it was worked out through an international political agreement. It was worked out through military, some of them perhaps legitimate, some of them terroristic on the part of Israel. There's been good and there's been bad in it. It's certainly not just a real clean thing that says God just came and did it. It's a development that had people pushing for it for a long time. And the earliest ones pushing for it were the dispensationalists who were very influential on the people who finally made the decision. I'm going to pass over a great deal. I want to just say, how should Christians evaluate this? Well, first of all, if anyone ever suggests, as I do, that the reestablishment of the nation of Israel is not a fulfillment of prophecy, and that they don't have a specifically a divine mandate to be there, invariably, there's going to be a very large number of dispensationalists who say you're anti-Semitic. 
This has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is racism against Jewish people. I don't have a thing against Jewish people any more than I have against Chinese people or Japanese people or Brazilian people or German people. Uh, I'm not a racist. I don't care what race a person is. It doesn't make any difference to me. I am interested in justice because Christians are supposed to be interested in justice. Justice is an important thing. And um, I have to say that while I'm not the least bit anti-Semitic, I do have concerns about some of the things that transpired when Israel was being formed as a nation and some that have happened since then. What I can say is this, I'm not in the crowd that says, because they are Jewish and because they're Israel, we cannot criticize any atrocities that they may commit. Israel has committed some atrocities, so have their enemies. I'm not really able to say who's done more. I don't have a full list of them all. All I can say is to say that we must always support Israel is no more true than saying we should always support England or any other ally. They are an ally of the United States, and therefore there's a certain amount of support by treaty that's expected, and I'm, I'm in favor of keeping treaties. Uh, I think that's part of justice. You make a treaty, you keep your treaties. So I believe that there's some kind of support that America owes to Israel as, as, a, as a, uh, an ally. But, and frankly, I'm very sympathetic toward the plight of, of people in Israel right now. I mean, not, most of the people in Israel now were not there in 1948. They were either born there or they've come there since then. And they came to a situation where they may not have displaced any Palestinians. Those Palestinians were displaced a lot earlier, in an earlier generation. So an Israeli who's born in Israel, and probably most of the people there now have been born there, um, they, didn't, you know, they didn't drive out any Palestinians, you know, any more than I drove out any American Indians. I didn't drive anyone out of here. I was born here. I, I understand that people who are born in Israel are in a very precarious situation. Their buses get blown up, their synagogues get shot up, their bar mitzvahs get terrorized by their enemies. And by the way, certain things go the other direction too. I don't pity, I mean, I do pity anyone who lives in that region. I'm not sure why anyone would want to if they didn't have to. It's a war zone. It's been a war zone for over a generation now. And I, I'm very sympathetic toward those terrible uh, victimized situations where Israelis have just been killed by terrorists. I'm also sympathetic toward Palestinians who are killed by terrorists or, or any other way. By the way, you may not be aware, there's a lot of Palestinian Christians Per capita, I've been told there's a much higher percentage of Palestinians who are Christians than of Israelis that are Christians. Certainly in Israel, only a very small minority of, of Israelis are Christians. But uh, Palestine has had the Eastern churches and the Coptic churches, I guess, in the region uh, for a long time. There's a lot of, lot, of, uh, lot of people there who are supposed to be our Christian brothers. And so, you know, when we just give our unwavering support to Israel no matter what happens. A lot of times we're supporting people who don't have any love for us as Christians, who are making war against people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm not saying the Israelis don't feel provoked. I'm sure they do. And I think that probably the Palestinians feel provoked too. There's a lot of hatred going both ways, and that's a sad situation. I don't know what the best solution is. Perhaps a two a two nation situation would be good, except the Arabs, of course, the surrounding Arab nations won't let Israel exist where they, they see them as intruders and you can see uh, you know the history might lead them to feel that way about it um, and therefore they want to wipe them out obviously most of the Arabs are not Christians and they're not going to have any Christian love toward Israel and therefore I'm not I'm not sure how things can be any different right now hopefully they can hopefully somehow in the progress of history Israel can become a peaceful place someday and that you know Palestinians and Israelis won't hate each other and want to kill each other. That already happens in churches. There are churches where Christians who are Palestinian and Christians who are Jews fellowship together and love each other. Only in Christ can there be reconciliation. But in terms of political reconciliation, I have no idea how that can be resolved. What I can say is the church has to be very, very careful about supporting things that Christians ought not to support. And a lot of times Christians do support or turn a blind eye to wrongdoing by Israelis, or we don't even hear about it in our press here, uh, but people over there do. And, and we just kind of turn a blind eye and think, oh, they're God's chosen people. You know, they're supposed to be there. This is, this is fulfillment of prophecy. Let me just clarify from Scripture, since we Christians supposedly do believe in Scripture. I do. In Jeremiah chapter 18, a very important thing that God said to Israel about themselves. In Jeremiah 18, in verse 7, he says, The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up, to pull it down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. 
Now, God just said, any time I threaten to destroy a nation, if they repent, I won't. And we know of a very important case like that in the Old Testament, don't we? Nineveh. Nineveh, yeah. I mean, God sent Jonah to Nineveh, said, in 40 days, Nineveh will perish. The people repented, and God repented and didn't destroy them. Now, notice, Jonah didn't say, unless you repent. There was no mention of repentance in Jonah's message. But the king of Nineveh said, maybe if we repent, God will have mercy on us. And lo and behold, he was right. And God says, that's right. Whether I mention it or not, if they repent, I will repent of the evil I said do. But then it continues. Now, on the other side of the ledger here. Verse 9. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and a concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. Do you know of any nations in history that God has ever said he would build and plant? I only know of one. And that would be who? Israel in the Old Testament. God promised to build and plant them. He says, whenever I say I'm going to build and plant a nation, and he says, if it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice when I, I, he says, then I will repent concerning the good that I said I would do to it. In other words, if I say I'm going to do good to a nation, that's conditional. Mm -hmm. If they go the wrong way, I will repent of all the promises I made to them. If, uh, if I say I'm going to destroy a nation and they repent, then I'll forget what I said. I'm going to change my mind. I won't do it. God's saying, I don't give anyone an unconditional pass here. If you're an evil nation and I threaten to destroy you, if you turn to God, I won't destroy you. If you're my nation and I promise to build a plant, but you turn into evil, I'm going to repent of all the promises I made to you. Now, this is not something new coming up in Jeremiah. This was back in the law. Moses said the same thing twice in uh, Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy 28. Particularly, look at Deuteronomy 28, if you would. Both of these chapters, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, God tells Israel what he will do for them if they are obedient. And then he tells what he's going to do if they're not obedient. Jeremiah, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 28 is more uh, extensive than Leviticus. So I want to look at that. Notice Deuteronomy 28 begins this way. Now it shall come to pass if you, that is you Israel, diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall overtake you and come upon you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Not because of who your ancestors are, not because of your race, because of you obeying me, I will give these blessings. Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, uh, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall, be, uh, shall you be when you come in, blessed you shall be when you go out, and so forth, a lot more blessings besides. Now, when he comes to verse 15, he says, the flip side. In verse 15, he says, But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all the commandments and all his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall you be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of, the, of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out, and so forth. And this goes on to the rest of the chapter very much at length. But if you look... At verses 45, well, look at verse 20, for example, and 21. He says, The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you're going to possess. Okay, so if they break the covenant, they lose the land. Further on down, in the same chapter, verses 45 and 46, he says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever. Whoa. Forever? The curses of the violated covenant will be upon Israel and their descendants forever. You know, a lot of people, dispensationalists, myself included, when I was one, would say, these promises that God made to Israel, they're forever. He promised them the land forever. He said he'd, they'd be his people forever. Yeah, but there were conditions, weren't there? Right. Of course there were. Now he says, if you violate those conditions, you'll have all these curses on you forever. It's all forever, but it's all conditional. They could, have, they could be a blessed people forever if they keep his covenant and obey his voice, or they could be a cursed people forever. There's no unconditional blessing to any people on earth. 
being the nation of Israel, required that they obey his voice and keep his covenant. That was the first contract he made at Mount Sinai. They broke it, and again, and again, and again. And no, they never broke it so badly as when they crucified the Messiah. And Jesus said to them just before that, he said, the kingdom of God is taken from you, and is given to a nation that will bring forth the fruits of it. He said that in Matthew 21, verse 44, I think it is. So what do we see? We see a nation that was given more privileges than any other nation. Greater blessings promised than any other, but they're conditional. Everything's conditional. There's no unconditional promises. Jeremiah made that very clear. If I say I'm going to bless and plant and build a nation, if they turn for me, I'm going to repent of all the things I said to do for them. We're done. Now, does that mean that you know Israelis can't be saved or Jews can't be saved? No, of course they can't be the same as anyone else. But they are saved as individuals. And when they're saved, they're part of what we call the church, now the body of Christ. There's no Jew or Gentile in Christ. In other words, being Jewish isn't significant any more than being Irish. It never really was when they were disobedient to the covenant because the nation of Israel was defined by covenant obedience, not by race. Korah, who was the earth opened up and swallowed Korah, he was a Levite. He was a Jew. Judas Iscariot was a Jew. Caiaphas was a Jew. These guys are in shale today, you know? These guys are not saved. No one was ever saved by being a Jew. People were God's people because they were obedient to the covenant or not. They, then they weren't. And Jesus came, made a new covenant, and anyone who wants to be one of God's people now can be. A Jew can be. A Gentile can be. There's no distinction. And when they come in, there's no distinction either. Once they become Christians, they are, there's no distinction. And when I was a dispensationalist, when I was young, I knew the Bible said things like that, but I, I just hadn't processed it. I think I was very much a product of the whole mood of the church I was in, which is all about Israel, all excited about Israel. My pastor took tours to Israel every year. I think maybe more than once a year. I'm not sure, but at least every year. For, for 40 years or more. Um, so excited. They'd send money to Israel for the rebuilding project of the temple. You ever heard of a church doing that? There are churches that do that. I think John Hagee's church does that. I'm not sure. I don't want to lie about it, but there's quite a few churches that do it. I think he does. And it, the church I was in did. Do you realize what that means? What is the temple? It's a slaughterhouse where animals are sacrificed because people who do it don't recognize Jesus as the final sacrifice. It's a It's a a different religion than Christianity. To support a Jewish temple is to support a, a religious shrine that is in opposition to Jesus Christ. Just like if you built a mosque or you know, a Hindu temple or something like that. A temple that isn't about Jesus is about a religion that's anti-Jesus. And you know that, that churches would send money to build the temple, that they'd have an Israeli flag on their, uh, on their uh, platform, that they, they get all excited about everything in Israel. I don't know if you've noticed, but some people are so excited about Israel, they, they're not anywhere near as excited about Jesus. I don't want to say that was true of all the dispensationalists I knew, and it wasn't of me. I, Jesus was always first to me even when I was a dispensationalist. But there are people I meet more excited about Israel than Jesus. They, more, there are preachers who preach more about Israel, at least more with more excitement about Israel than about Jesus. I, hope, I don't think they're in the majority even among dispensationalists, but they exist. John Hagee, in fact, who holds what's called a dual covenant theology, he believes that Gentiles to be saved have to be obedient to Christ. That is, they have to believe in Christ, they have to come into the new covenant. But Jews can be saved by keeping the old covenant. That's what John Hagee teaches. Now, that's just a perversion of dispensationalism. But see, dispensationalism holds that the Jews are special. Most dispensationalists wouldn't make them so special that they don't need Jesus. But, but uh, I mean, John Hagee has in his pulpit, you know, prime ministers of Israel or generals from the Israeli army on a regular basis to come speak to his congregation. And they're not even Christians. You know, they're just, they're, they're part of another religion, part of another nation. But, but this is because Israel is so central to the concerns of dispensationalism. Not so much in the Bible. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's because we are told this is a great miracle that has happened. Uh, well, I, I, again, I'm not prepared to say God didn't orchestrate these things. Maybe he did. I, I actually think that God orchestrated the discovery of America. Even though some bad things happened in our history, I think that America exists because of some plan that God has. But I'm not saying that because I think we're God's chosen people. I think England exists and Ireland exists. And I think every nation exists because God has some purpose for the people who live there um, and has some use for them. I think that's true of the modern state of Israel too. But I don't think the modern state of Israel was a necessity in the sense that, you know, it was destined to happen because the prophet said it would and God owes them something that was going to do that. that no, they... If you disobey my commandments, my curse will be on you and your descendants forever, he said. And 
A Jewish person or a Gentile person has exactly the same standing before God. If they're not a Christian, they're lost. If they are a follower of Christ, they're saved. And there's no distinction between them. God is not a racist. God doesn't care who your ancestors are. He cares who your God is and what covenant you're obeying. So what should we say? I, I think when it comes to thinking about modern Israel, we should think about modern Israel as we think about any nation. If they do things that are unjust, we should condemn those things. We don't delegitimize them as a, as a nation. We just say those are things that no one should do. Those are bad things. If they do a lot of them, then we begin to think of them as a bad nation. But on the other hand, if they are trying to mind their own business, trying to live a, a peaceful society, a just society, and they're, and they're victimized by enemies who are aggressive and nasty, we should sympathize with them in those cases. But every nation has a little of both of those things. Every nation on the planet has some things they do right and, and some enemies that come against them for no good reason. And every nation has some things they do wrong, which Christians have to stand aloof from the, from the national loyalties and stand as members of the kingdom of God, which is transnational. The kingdom of God is the whole society of followers of Jesus Christ internationally. And we have to judge our own nation. And we have to judge the other nations. That is, insofar as we have an opinion, we have to make a judgment. Are they doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And we, don't, we shouldn't give anyone a pass. We shouldn't give America a pass when we do unjust things. I actually think America is a good country, and I think we do more good things than most nations do. But we've done some things that Christians should not be able to get, should not blind ourselves to. We should recognize evil when it's done even with our own nation. And we should recognize when it's done by Israel or any other nation too. The main thing about the modern state of Israel is it's just a modern state. It's not a religious people. It's not a godly people. It's certainly not a Christian people. And they are a state that has a, a modern democracy which makes them a lot more like ourselves in that respect and, and unlike the nations around them, and makes them more of a natural ally to us. And so as allies of America, well, I think we should support them as America should support its allies. But, but as far as making them have a divine mandate that nothing can, you know, they're invulnerable from all criticism, that I don't think is part of the Christian's attitude toward any nation, including Israel. So that may be all news to you. And I, I have uh, 14 pages of notes that I've not brought up uh, because, well, I actually have, uh, you know, some hours on this at my website, uh, teaching on this as well. But it's not something that I actually like to teach about very much, because I don't, I mean, if I was against the nation of Israel, then I'd look for every opportunity I could to undermine them. I'm not against them. I'm not against them. But what concerns me is how many Christians are favorable toward them, like, without making any moral judgments at all. I don't think that we're allowed to to, to be politically uh, in favor of uh, any nation without moral judgments being made about them. And so that's, I, I think we should evaluate Israel as we evaluate any nation. We're getting ready to watch a brief summary of two videos, one from Edward Hendry, one from Deanne Loper. They both talk about how Men like Jonathan Kahn and Itzhak Shapira and all these other messianic rabbis, which is an oxymoron to begin with, are called rabbis. They're calling themselves that. And the church is quick to get up in arms when a non-denominational charismatic calls him or herself an apostle, but they have no problem with these messianics and Hebrew roots people calling themselves rabbi. And they have no problem calling them rabbi themselves. It's just not hard to understand. What do you think these principalities from Canaan, like uh, the one that's in my second book, um, oh, there's an actual Nephilim who lives 5,000 years but there's also his father, Armoros, who comes from First Enoch. He's one of the leaders of the Watchers. What's your take on the leader of the Watchers 
what role the Watchers may have played in the mystery religions. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, they definitely play a role. Um, they were there before the flood. And, you know, the Freemasons have their theories that, um, I forget, it's like they wrote information that they were taught on columns and then they found the columns afterwards. Or uh, there's another theory that, you know, it was buried and, and someone found it afterwards. And either way, that that knowledge came from, you know, the Watchers passed down. Um, and then it was deified when it was passed on to humans. Those humans either embodied by demons or, or influenced by fallen angels or whatever it was. Have which you is ever why... read? Have you ever read or listened to the uh, book of First Enoch we have now? I've read it, yeah. Okay, because it, it says in there what, according to that text, what happened, what happened to the the knowledge. Re refresh my memory. I don't remember who did it at the moment. I did before I said it, but I didn't want to interrupt you. And I knew I was going to have to, but I didn't want to. But somebody... Uh, uh, Put it in stone. They carved it in stone. Was it Lamech? Might have been. Might have been. But then there's also two Lamechs, which, I mean, obviously, yeah. if, if someone did it, it's yeah. probably the, the one from the Cain line. Yeah. Just like there's two Enochs. I watched an episode of The Midnight Ride, like last week or week before last, that was... Um, I'm trying to remember the title of it. It was called the Evil Twin Syndrome, and it was about all of the people with the same name from the line of Seth and the line of Cain in the Book of Genesis. In Kabbalah, the God above the Sephirot tree Mute is like the one without end or the endless one the boundless one and i show in my book and my book is really just like a compilation of of rabbinic quotes from the talmud and the kabbalah but in kabbalah their god ein Sof, creates elohim he is the creator of the god of genesis and so i think it's just really important for christians to understand that we are we are not serving the same God as the Kabbalah rabbis. Okay, I'll go over like the cosmology. It's it's really, um, it's going to be shocking maybe and bizarre to those. And so I just want to point one thing out real quick since we're talking about principalities today and, and fallen angels and gods, each one of those circles on that Kabbalistic tree of life, which that's just what they call it. It's really the tree of knowledge. It comes from Gnosticism. It, the, it, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you might as well say, but it's actually just the tree of knowledge. Anyhow, each one of those circles is a god. It's a deity. Oh, he is the he is um he it's called zimzum <laughs> the sparks, some of the terms the sparks the, yes yeah, yes yeah. he he came from a point he created a point of light it says and then he contracted himself and then he created the 10 spheres of the sephirot tree so the one at the top is called the crown and it's also called keter or keter and it's also called Elohim, and that is the God of Genesis. So there again, Ein Sof creates Genesis or creates um, Elohim. And this Elohim or Keter is androgynous. He's male and female, and that might bring to mind the Baphomet. I mean, this all goes back to mystery Babylon is really what it is. So at the top of the tree is Keter, and male and female and from him comes the, the next two sephirot hakma and bina and then hakma and bina 
come together in what's called Heros Gamos. It's like a mystical sexual union. And that is depicted by the six pointed star, the, the star, the triangle, excuse me, the triangle with the upward point and the triangle coming down represent fire and water. And then those two come together in a sexual union and then they create the next Sephira and it goes all the way down to the last Sephira, which is Malkut. That's the earth. That's the kingdom of God. That's really the kingdom of God is Israel, physical Israel, what we would know today as Zionism. But the interesting thing is um, the Kabbalah says that those 10 spheres could not hold the light of Ensof and they shattered. And it was up to Keter or Keter, people pronounce it different ways, who is also Adam Kadmon. This is the celestial Adam. It's not the Adam that we think of in the Bible. He puts it all back together and there's like, there's lights coming out of his forehead and he builds this whole thing again. And when the shattering happened, you mentioned the sparks, the sparks scattered and some fell down to the earth, some went back up to their source. But one of the interesting things is, is part of the sparks went into the abyss. See, there's a hidden uh, Sephira right under Keter and that's called Da'at. And that's called, that means knowledge. And it's also referred to as the abyss. And some of those sparks fell into the abyss. So, that's considered uh, part of the Shekinah, the female aspect of God. And I think it was Gershom Sholem in my, in my book, I quote him. He said that God himself, because in Kabbalah, everything is one. And because everything is one, God himself is in that pit waiting to come out. And he can't or she cannot come out until she has assistance from those who are calling on her to come out. I'm going to tell you a secret. There is only one way to get this collect call. May it be, here's the, 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 the prayer in English, may it be your will that at the sounding of the shofar that we blow today, we will be as a sword fabric that is filled with the fear of the one in charge, Tartiel, as you accepted Elijah, blessed be his name, and Yeshua. This is the only place in rabbinic language that the name Yud, Shin, Vav, Ein is mentioned. That Yeshua, who is called the Prince of the Face, who is being Prince Metatron, may you fill us with his mercy. Blessed be your name, Lord of mercies. Hello. That should Very tell you everything you need to know. Cult. But the way that, you know, Zionism is just like you said, exploding. And I, I give quotes in my book, you know, that even New Age leaders said, and I read this for 30 years, that the evangelical church itself would be the main instrument to bring this new world order about. And Alice Bailey said the same thing. Yes. So I warned about this for years, but getting to the root of it, you know, none of that really to see. I, when I was doing my research, it, it was it was like a lot of people weren't really too interested or listening because they were not deceived by new age leaders and practices or Hinduism or even Islam. But this Zionism, this kingdom of God on earth, this Metatron posing as Yeshua is very, very deceptive. And I, I see a lot of people going over to that crossing over, crossing over into Judaism. And when everyone was just, you know, cr on the crying out about the uh, Sharia law, it was like the Lord was showing me that's almost like a distraction. I mean, I know it's real, but I started telling people about the Noahide laws 
and these are found in the Babylonian Talmud. And there are six. The one that we are concerned about as Christians, there are six laws. The seventh is to establish courts of justice to enforce the others. And I've heard that there are currently Noahide training centers all over the United States right now. Um, the Chabad Lubavitch rabbis are probably the main force behind this. They, they meet with the presidents of the United States and, pro and different government leaders of other nations, the United Nations, and they get these signed in year after year to, and to make sure that they're still in place. Um, but the one that we are concerned about is the prohibition uh, against idolatry. And one of the ways that that's listed right. oneness of God. See what the, what the rabbis of Kabbalah and the Talmud rabbis are doing, some of them maybe even unknowingly, they have rejected Jesus Christ. And therefore, they're constantly pushing prophecy out to the future. And even probably having a part in what is called self-fulfilled prophecy. So they're trying to, to make these, when they say, say Zechariah, in that day, the Lord shall be one. And the, the Kabbalah says that Hashem will, will be one. And the Tetragrammaton alone shall be exalted in that day. So anyone, any Christian who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Messiah would be guilty of idolatry under Noahide law. And this, this severe penalty, it says, in the Babylonian Talmud is beheading. So that's a chilling thought. If those laws were ever actually put in place okay who were possessed literally possessed by the devil before yep. he went forth and did his final betrayal of christ those same devils are alive today tel aviv exactly exactly and and it really it really drives home the point when jesus said you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do again sort of giving us a an indication of the nature of the opponent he was facing. Now, Jesus, you said there, Jesus told the Pharisee Jews, which is Orthodox Judaism, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. He said, you're of your father, the devil. Now, now look, I've, I've talked to so many Christians over the years. Uh, you know, I've been so blessed in the 25 years uh, that we've had power of prophecy ministry. And pastors have said, I don't understand the Jewish thing text. I don't understand the Zionist thing. I mean, what's the big deal? Why is that important? I mean, after all, you know, all it really is is the Jews, the rabbis, believe in the Old Testament, and we have Jesus in the New Testament. So really all we have to do is give them Jesus, and they'll be like completed Jews. And they, they, they actually believe that Judaism is Old Testament, and Christianity has just added the New Testament. But if Jesus said, you're of your father the devil— they could not have been with the, the Old Testament, right? That wasn't of the devil. That's right. The Old Testament is of, of God. That's right. So so obviously their religion was not of the Old Testament, and, and you're saying it's not today of the Old Testament. So what is their religion, the religion of the Jews? If it's of the devil, what are its components? How? What have you found out in your research and study? What is? Why does the Bible talk about the synagogue of Satan? If it's only the Old Testament. Okay. Well, it's it's Babylonian by source, witchcraft by nature. Okay, so it is it is a religion of witchcraft. Mm. And as an example, uh, they have many magic talismans that the Jews use. You have the same thing in the Roman Catholic Church with their iconography. There it's the same it's the same thing only it is the Gentile version of the Judaic magic talismans. Magic is woven all through Judaism, okay? Now, it is uh, an esoteric magic. It is not revealed to 
the the general populace. Uh, it is concealed even from most Jews. Uh, it is the hierarchy that is in tune with this witchcraft. It is the same way in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, people are, are they they worship idols. Okay. Now the but they the Catholic Church has has told them, well, we're not really worshiping idols. We look at the idol in order to give us uh, bring to us the, to mind the saint that we're praying for, for instance. Well, that brings up another issue. That's the that's the witchcraft of necromancy, of of communicating with the dead, uh, which, by the way, uh, the rabbis do also. Uh, they engage in necromancy. So you, you, the parallelisms between what happens in the Roman Catholic Church and what happens in Judaism are striking. Uh, their doctrines are so close. And it really, when you when you look at the source for the Roman Catholic doctrines, uh, the source comes from Babylon, and it's through the Jews who brought it into the Roman Catholic Church, and in fact established the Roman Catholic Church uh, early on uh, in early Christianity. The Judaizers, who were trying to draw people into their Judaic Babylonian form of Christianity were clearly known and clearly seen as a danger. Uh, the true Christians uh, saw what, what the Judaizers were doing, saw the danger of it, wrote about it, okay? They were not deceived, okay? Because as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they will not follow another. So the true sheep would not follow the Judaizers. But as you know, narrow is the way to salvation, but wide is the way to destruction. So while the few stayed away from the Judaizers uh, and that Judaic Babylonian form of Christianity, which became Roman Catholicism, the vast majority were enticed by it, were, uh, were you know, and, 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 you know, were convinced that that was, in fact, the Christian church. In fact, most Roman Catholics believe that they're Christian. If you tell them they're not a Christian, they will be, uh, they would be insulted. Uh, but, in fact, there's nothing Christian about the Roman Catholic Church, and nor is there anything Christian about the early Judaic Babylonian uh, uh, faction uh, that, that, that became the Roman Catholic Church. And, again, if you go back to uh, Revelations chapter 17, what did... John say about uh, mystery the, Babylon the Great when he saw her, I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And so that was his response. Well, that's the response of, of many who see the Roman Catholic Church. They have this facade of piety, uh, but in fact, when you look at their deeds, their evil deeds, they manifest the true nature of the Roman Catholic Church. And, and their deeds truly are evil, uh, including uh, pederasty and, and all of the things that, are, that, that uh, have been in the news, uh, which is just the tip of the iceberg with regard to, you know, the, the sins of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Ed, I, I used to be in the chaplaincy in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say in a past life, you know. <laughs> I know there's only one life you live before you go into judgment. But uh, I was in the Air Force for 20 years. I was in the chaplaincy for a number of years, and I worked very close with a uh, Jewish chaplains. Uh, and I remember the first chaplain I worked with was an Orthodox Jew, and his office was right next door to mine. And then a little later on, a few years uh, after that, I went overseas, and, and uh, I worked with another uh, Jewish. Uh, I mean, we didn't have the same religious services or anything like that. We were totally separate, but we worked together, you know, at least – we were office together and knew each other and so forth. Uh, and that's the way sort of the military system was. Then, then there was a, a Jew who was a, uh, a rabbi who was what I call, what I call, uh, actually he said he was a member of the conservative Judaism. I found it later on, actually, we would call it liberal Jews. <laughs> you know, but they call it conservative uh, Jews. So we're with two different kinds of rabbis. Now, the first rabbi, uh, one time uh, we went to lunch together and we were chatting uh, and I asked this rabbi uh, how much emphasis was put on the uh, Old Testament 
uh, and I was trying to sort of, you know, ask him what he knew about the prophecies that related to Jesus coming, you know, that are found in Isaiah and other places in the Old Testament. And he looked at me and he said, oh, we don't study that. We don't study the Old Testament. I said, you don't? He says, no, 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 no. We, we have another a set of books. And I said, what is that? He said, well, it's just another set of books. Well, you know, he, he didn't even tell me the name of it. I found it later. It was the Talmud. But he said, we study that because that, that, that is everything we need to know. That's what the rabbis, the sages, have told us. In other words, they don't study the Old Testament. And here's a man who's an Air Force chaplain. He's approved by the Orthodox Jews to come in the Air Force. That shows that he certainly uh, meets their approval and their acceptance. Uh, and he's holding worship services for Jews that are airmen. And he's telling me he didn't really study the, the Old Testament. He didn't want to talk it over with me because he, he said, really, I'm not literate in that. He's, I know that you Baptists, I was a Baptist at the time. Now I'm just a non-denominational non non Christian, just in other words, a Bible believer. But he said, I know you Baptists know the Bible better than I do, even the Old Testament. But we have our own books by our rabbi sages, and that's what we study. But he wouldn't even tell me what they were. Now, your book tells me exactly what he was studying, uh, Ed. You know what he was studying. But it's interesting that he admitted that he did not study the Old Testament, that other books were considered more important. Now, let me get to the point that I'm going to ask you this. It's said that the Pope is infallible in matters of doctrine, but he's just a man, right? Now here we have this Orthodox Jewish rabbi saying, Tex, we don't study the word of God. We study the writings and word of men. Is there a difference between that? What, what, what's going on here? How do, you, how do you relate to what I just told you? There's clear parallelism between how the Jewish religion and Roman Catholicism. In, in Judaism, uh, their Talmud today is actually, the, those are the writings that uh, were the oral traditions at the time of Christ. Uh, and so the very thing that Christ criticized them for uh, following their traditions in place of God's laws, okay, they've later codified into several volumes called the Talmud, okay? Uh, there's the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Tal Talmud is the more authoritative of the two, uh, and that is, that is what they follow. The Talmud, uh, if you read it, and there's a fantastic website called Come In Here, which has about 90% of the Talmud uh, online. And people can read it. It's been translated into English. Well, it, you have a lot of it in your book. You have all kinds of uh, quotes I went, right I went from the through, Talmud. I went through a good portion of it and picked out the, those things which were notable and were important for people to know. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, the Antichrist nature of the Talmud. But the Talmud, in fact, all of Judaism is really a religion whose focus uh, is on Christ, but it, the, it's on the hatred of Christ and the hatred of Christians. And I don't, I don't want to overstate it, and I, I explain with authority in, in the book, point by point. For instance, let me just give you an example. Uh, in the Talmud, uh, they describe Jesus as right now being in torments, torments, in boiling hot semen. Uh, that is how they describe, they blasphemously describe Jesus Christ. Uh, their Passover ceremony is, has become a ceremony where they attack Christ and Christians, and it is turned into basically a, a ceremony, uh, an antichrist ceremony. So, the Jewish religion uh, is really the one thing all Jews agree on. No matter what else they disagree about, the one thing they all agree on is that Jesus is not the Messiah. They all are against Christ. They reject Christ, whether it's an um, a Orthodox Jew uh, or whether the, the person is a Reformed Jew. 
uh, even th even though Orthodox and Reformed Jews are really uh, there's quite a controversy between them. In fact, Orthodox Jews don't even consider Reformed Jews true Jews. But the one thing that they both agree on is that Christ Jesus is not the Messiah, and that that view of using their traditions to set aside God's laws and as codified in their Talmud is found in the Roman Catholic Church as well. The Roman Catholic Church considers the magisterium of the church to be the final authority, and that magisterium is made up of the doctrines of the church added to the Bible. Now, what happens is, while they say that, what in fact happens is it's their doctrines which supplant the doctrines of the Bible. So they say they've added, but they have actually over, uh, supplanted uh, those provisions of the Bible which are the gospel. And they've created their own religion which parallels very closely the Babylonian religion. So the same... And the, 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 the infallibility of the Pope is derived from Judaism. Now, uh, you know, you mentioned in your book, and you, you prove, of course, and document, that the Catholic Church in its catechism, its new catechism, actually tells Catholics that in terms of uh, doctrine and faith, the final authority is the Church rather than the Bible. Isn't that true? That's true. Uh, I mean, they really, they, they really blast fundamentalist Bible-believing Christians and they say that the era that people like Edward Henry and Tex Mars would make then is that we have the Bible as our source, and they have the Pope. Well, and, and when you talk when you talk to a Catholic about what the Bible says, because they are kept in ignorance about what the Bible says, their retort usually is, "Well, that's your interpretation." Mm. See, and that's how you interpret it. But we have this long history, this church, which has read the Bible, and all their experts have said, this is what it really means, and so we're going to go by what the, what the Roman Catholic hierarchy has decided it means. So we don't have uh, uh, an interpretation, they, they say, by a man who's read the Bible. We have an interpretation that's officially stamped by the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, it is infallible and therefore without error and irreversible, irreformable. It is, it is the true doctrine, okay? And if you say something contrary, then you are against the Pope. The Pope is deemed to be infallible. You are not. You're wrong. That, that's, how they've been, that's how they've been conditioned. Well, now the, it's the, hard the, to the found that. The rabbi that uh, I worked with, uh, now that I look back on it, he would probably say uh, my beliefs are based on what Rabbi uh, Maimonides said uh, back, you know, hundreds of years ago, or my beliefs are based on Rabbi Ben Eleazar, what he said. So they rely on uh, rabbis who are dead. Okay. Um, I think that from listening to Deanne Loper, I know we only listened to Deanne for a minute, but she showed what the Kabbalists believe. Um, she showed what, let's see, where's the view thing? There we go. She showed what the... the Jewish rabbi who calls himself a messianic rabbi, um, what he believes and it's just Gnosticism, Kabbalah, up one side, down the other. Then you got Edward Hendry showing that the Prince of Persia, it doesn't matter if it's the Jews that live in Jerusalem, if it's the ones that are 
in Iran who do not want to be called Arabs. Like, they're serious about that thing, man. Do not call us Arabs. <laughs> you know, we are Syrians. You know, we are not Arabs. And the Palestinians are the same way. Well, I've never heard Dean Loper say anything like this, or at least I didn't remember it. But <laughs> she was talking about uh, the very same thing when it comes to them self-fulfilling prophecy. Like she said, they're using Revelation as a guidebook, and it's almost like self-fulfilling prophecy, which is exactly what I said when we did the the first part of this Monday, day before yesterday. What I really just wanted everyone to get from watching just a little bit of those two videos that you've already seen if if you you know follow this channel regularly because they've been up for months and months one of them i think's been up for a year but like the point is it doesn't matter where or what country uh, we're talking about. This isn't two angels fighting in the spiritual realm. Like we said in part one, I was mistaken was what I was getting at. You know, it's not, <laughs> I, I never said it was a good angel and a fallen angel fighting. I said it was two fallen ones. But if you look at who they worship, If it's the prince of Persia, but I think I, you know, um, I have a very good reason for why I agree with what you said Monday about it definitely being, you know, something going on in the spiritual that's spilling over into the physical, but that, you know, you just didn't know enough to say for sure yes it's the prince of persia fighting whoever you know what i mean yeah and i agree with you um i was pretty much positive that's what was going on to begin with but you know what i began to see in studying this there's videos galore out that say exactly what I was going to have us talking about. It's the main reason that I s said we've got to change this. Because each of the people that I saw doing these videos, the main one that's doing them, there's two people that I saw more than anybody else. One's a dispensationalist, and the other is Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Mm. It's Ali said out of time and Jonathan Kahn. Mm. So you know, I, I I think we both agreed yesterday Jesus is the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. So there's nothing left from Ezekiel. Which is the prophecy that uh, Ali Sadatatan is using that he's saying is being fulfilled before our eyes in the Middle East and is yet to be fulfilled and talking about the prophecy in Joel. And I'm like, have you not read the book of Acts? Do you not remember the day of Pentecost? Hmm. Because Peter literally quotes the prophecy from Joel and declares that the end times have begun. Because that's what right. the prophecy is about. 
you know when he says your your young men will dream dreams and your old men will prophesy and i may have it backwards or whatever but you 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 know the prophecy i'm talking about right yeah well when peter declares that this prophecy is fulfilled he says this day this this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears he didn't say it's partially fulfilled. He didn't say it started. He said, this day this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears. I don't understand why people... I, got, I know I'm repeating myself. It's because they got all sorts of noise and other interpretations yeah. that block out their ears. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But that... That's, I, uh, all I was going to say was what I had already said, was that it's very simple to understand. But when you take the simplicity of Christ and make it murky with doctrines of men, yep. and even worse, demonic doctrines, then... At best, you make it extremely hard to understand. Yeah. And at worst, you change it to where it's not even the gospel anymore. All right. Well, you know, they, they were talking a lot about how, um, you know, the Catholic Church was, you know, emulating and in many ways similar and built off this same Jewish mysticism. Yep. And I just thought I would mention something I was researching recently, which is that some of that iconology and idolatry of the Catholic Church, a lot of the symbolism um, includes the sun. And that goes back to the mysticism, the worship of the sun um, as their deity and all these things. A but tremendous then interestingly, amount. What's that? I, did, I was agreeing with you. Oh, okay. Interestingly, the symbol of Islam is, you, you know, they have it on their flag, the moon with the, the little moon. star. And so that is the du dualism. It brings us back to that. And when you look into the origins of Islam, it's very peculiar because Muhammad, the first revelation came to him in a cave where they claim the angel Michael came to him and told him um, to read. Gabriel. To read, uh, what was it? Gabriel, was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, Gabriel, yeah. Came to him and told him to read, um, which he was an illiterate, so he said no. Yeah. A and again, they demanded read, and he's still an illiterate. <laughs> so that doesn't make sense. But he goes back to his wife, who was a Christian, and there's documentation. Um, one of the best ones is from a former Jesuit who was told in the Vatican and then later on converted to actual Christianity that this was actually a setup that Muhammad's wife and her brother-in-law or yeah brother-in-law I believe no no sorry and her brother who was Muhammad's brother-in-law that they converted to Christianity as a way of getting the Roman Catholics back in power because at that time they had lost power from the barbarians who were actually other Christian nations that had been converted to true Christianity, but they're called barbarians to give them a bad name. Yeah. And so these so-called Christian Muslims who, you know, that in history they became Muslims, but they had converted to Catholicism, that they basically went out as an arm of the Catholic Church to find themselves a fake messiah that they could raise up and muhammad was an orphan and he was an illiterate so who better to train and raise up than someone who has no idea what's going on and um and then they used the the muslims to take back their control from the barbarians who were in control at that time as basically like an arm uh, as like a warfare arm yeah. And then when you look at the sim symbology of the sun and the moon and how they come together, it's not just Catholicism and Jewish mysticism. It's all three of the big <laughs> religions all united in one. 
So that, that I thought was interesting and kind of caps you. things off well. I'm not laughing at you. You just you're you're quoting the Kingdom Productions documentary Unholy Alliance. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> um, yeah, like it, it goes from Muhammad to uh, the um, Knights Templar and the Hashishan Alliance in mm. the Crusades, but like. It just, it was, it never ceases to blow my mind. Like the similarities God just keeps showing me. It's just crazy. Yeah. But yeah, that I was agree. the last thing I wanted to say. I feel like connecting all three that, that caps things yes. off kind of nicely. And again, it's all built off, you know, the, the tree of life and Kabbalah, and that's built off the mysticism and, you know, all um, the things that came from and before and, and goes the paganism. Back to Persia, Zoroastrianism. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, like yeah. ancient Persia, you know, ancient Mecca, as a matter of fact, had the Kaaba, right? I was and, just going to bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it had yeah. all, it was the house of all the gods and with the chief god being Baal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have a video on that here on the channel as well. And like, uh, they w- did the walk around like the same way that the Roman Catholics, yep. uh, you know, they bring in all the pagan aspects and this Christianize them, so to speak. That's what the Muslims did with the, the, uh, pagan nations of the Middle East. Like they just, <laughs> literally made the and to go with your point it it makes perfect sense like the jews like the so-called messianic jews will use things like yeshua when it comes to Metatron, because they know they're not talking about Jesus. Right. But they're not going to call Jesus the Messiah. Not by that name. Yeah, they'll call him Jesus, but they'll never call him Jesus Christ, because then that brings in the the Christos and whatnot. Do you know who the Messiah is in Islam? Jesus is the Messiah. They just don't believe he's God, son of God. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they they believe he's the Messiah and he's in the the uh whatever it's called, the um Quran. Yeah. He's in the Talmud too, but uh it's a yeah, little not in the same way. bit of difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's Muslims right. they believe he was born of a virgin, pretty much everything you need to know, but then they, they mix bu- in the one lie with all those truths, which is that you know, he didn't actually die on the cross. They replaced him. And that's really the the biggest thing that you need because he died for our sins. And if he didn't die for our sins, then none I of the other stuff matters. I didn't so. know that part. I knew that Gnostics believed that. But I thought Muslims just didn't believe he rose again. I, I didn't know that. I learned something No, they think like every day. they took him down from the cross and they put someone else. And so that's who ended up going into the tomb and... I, I obviously well, it falls that's, flat on its face because it's all craziness. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate all of you. Before I say like the final phrase I say at the end of every episode, why don't you tell people how we met this time and then I'll close it out. All right. Yeah. So, well, we were just talking about Gary Wayne and, I have only just found out about Gary Wayne. So I found your channel by looking through his stuff that comes up when you search him and different things. And it said about the little C's and I'm like, all right, yeah, let me see what he thinks about this. And um, so I left a comment because I didn't, I didn't hate him. I, I didn't, you know, nothing like that, but I didn't agree with his conclusions, which was sort of a, a dismissal of the whole idea. And so I left a comment um something along the lines like you both are very knowledgeable clearly 
but it seems that that knowledge might be hindering you because, you know, with the little season, you can't, it, it's something where, you know, like it, it's intuition led it's, it, in some ways where you can't go to history and be like, oh, this is the proof right here. It's evidence based. And, uh, you know, something along those lines with what I said, I didn't quite go into it that depth. And we had a conversation and it was clear that, you know, neither one of us hated each other. We were both absolutely brothers in Christ. And that led you to inviting me on the program, which is October 31st, which everyone should absolutely watch and join us for. And Amen. Then, uh, absolutely. And then that this was only last week, too. So then this week you were like, hey, do you want to come on and, and co-host uh, and talk about the Prince of Persia and the principalities and whatnot? It's like, you know what? Yeah, let's do it. So here we are. So, yeah, it's literally not even a full week because that was like, I think, Thursday or Friday last week. So, yeah. I hope you got something out of it. And I know that those that God meant to get something got what God had for them because we prayed for it at the beginning. That's right. <laughs> and we serve a God who answers prayers. We have a good, good father who I love with all my heart. I still to this day wonder why he puts up with me, um, why he ever gave me a chance. I don't know the answer, but I'm thankful he did, and I'm thankful for all of you. I love all of you. I hope to see you all next time for the Remnant Report and for Kingdom Productions and Publishing, Kingdom Productions Network. I am the Remnant Warrior saying God bless each and every one of you. I love you. Grace. And peace.